Dr. Power, your guests have arrived. Oh, thanks, Chelsea. Hi, folks. Come on in. Hayden, there's a seat here for you, and Catherine, Katie over here. Um, Bill, good to see you again. Uh, Bill, you really enjoy your post. You're, re you're really pushing my head. Thank you. Well, folks, thank you. This is uh, session four. Let's get underway if we can. Uh, at the outset, uh, this is the uh, uh, remembrance uh, period coming up for our vets who uh, have done their piece for Canada to make us strong and free and sovereign and independent. And uh, we need to pause for a few minutes, particularly on November the 11th, rather than just a holiday, just take a few minutes to thank those who uh, currently serve in places like Afghanistan with our special forces over there and uh, other places around the globe just to show the Canadian flag. And so to all you folks, we, we thank you for your service. Um, what else is on my mind today? Um, first, again, uh, uh, I encourage you on the weekends to try to find some time with your spouse. You owe her or him big time uh, to get you through this. Um, they're helping you drive towards your dreams, so uh, spend a little time with them as well on the period we get closer to November, November the 11th. Um, notice the price of oil is uh, $54 a barrel, and uh, I say wow to that, but there's some extra factors going on that's changing that demand supply curve. Certainly the Saudis have suggested that they're going to uh, try to lead OPEC into reducing the supply into the system. I don't have much hope for that, but uh, they're going to try, but you have that sense right now that the market's looking ahead about three to six months, and it is uh, uh, increasing the price. So that's good for our folks in Alberta. It's good for Canada, where petro currency is good for Russia. They're a petro currency. It's good for Venezuela, if they could get their act together. Nigeria, all these countries that produce oil, uh, it's a good thing. But I think the reality is, and we're discovering that in this class, we're talking about fossil fuels, alternative energies, uh, the mid-term, long-term role for fossil fuels, uh, coal and oil and things of that nature, um, are not promising. And I, I truly believe that uh, our dollars will normally stay uh, less than $50 a barrel, which is a great impact of what we do on the, on the prairies. But could be wrong, but uh, based on the fundamentals, that's my, my belief. But there's no wrong right answers in this class as we go through it. Um, last week, we looked at the external and internal uh, considerations, that first part of the strategic uh, uh, three C's for crafting a strategy, populating the customers and the company and, and the competitors and what models you use, start pulling that data together, both external information and internal information in order to make a decision. And we do strategy every day, folks. I mean, just crossing the street to get to this, this office today, I had to come to the corner intersection and go through all those steps I'm asking you to do when crafting a strategy. I came to the intersection, I gathered external information, I looked left and right to see what was coming down the road. I saw cars, new drivers, some coming fast, some coming slow. Uh, but I had to make that consideration, this little thing between my ears, as to uh, what that meant to me and drew some conclusions from it. Then internally, I looked at this old farce body at 76, 77, and said, well, I'm not going to be able to jog across. i got to wait for the light to change. And even then, i got so many seconds. Can I make it? But uh, by the same token, some of you folks are young enough with sneakers, you don't have to come to the corner. You can jaywalk and take that's your strategy to get from here to there um, and what position you're going to occupy. And so we do all those considerations every day without thinking about it. We look externally, we look internally what we've got to work with, and based on those two things, we come up with a, with a plan on how we're going to occupy that other corner or how we're going to get over to there. And uh, we just do it without thinking. Well, it's the same thing happened for strategists. You just get practice at it. You'll do it without thinking. You'll look at external and internal stuff we talk about every day. So anyway, that's what we did last week. Uh, we looked at some tools as well. This week, I want to move on to the Porter's 5 generic strategy, basically low cost and differentiation. Um, and uh, low cost is just that sort of information like Walmart, uh, like uh, Costco, concrete floors, doesn't really matter what the walls look like, it's the low prices that are tracked to there. Differentiation is the story of the Emperor's New Clothes. As marketeers, if I can plant that seed in your mind that you need that Mont Blanc pen or that Mercedes to make you who you are, uh, then I've done my job. And the better I am at producing that, the higher the price point's going to be that you'll accept and pay me for that, and hence the profits greater over my uh, fixed and variable costs on, uh, on producing the widget or the service. So we're going to talk a bit about that this uh, this week and do a small little context case. I thought it was RRU goes global in the back of my head, but it's not. It's a Sleeman case, and it's a fascinating story about John Sleeman. Um, the Sleeman company itself, during the uh, dirty 30s from Prohibition, uh, got involved, as did a number of large Canadian families like Seagram's, and they ran booze into the States. 
unfortunately Sleeman got caught and so the license was taken away from them and they lost their brewery license until sometime in the not too long ago, I stand to be corrected on this, I'm going to say sometime in the 80s, John was just running a corner little brew pub uh, somewhere with the Sleeman's name on it and his grandmom came back in, slid him the recipe for Sleeman's beer and uh, said, John, go restore the family name. And so using other people's money, he uh, didn't have a lot, but he went to a lot of other folks and it merges and acquisitions, a great growth strategy for your organizations. And uh, there's a Shelley McDade uh, video up in the clip. She's gone through a number of mergers and acquisitions for the credit union um, that are worth looking at. In fact, I acted as a consultant with them when they did the four mergers, and uh, we learned a lot of lessons out of that. So there's a videotape up there. Look at Shelley's thing, see what you think about it. Um, you'll also find up there, which is interesting, I. Uh, was going to uh, those who wanted to send for it, but it was so popular I put it up on the site in the bonus section. Um, the vice president of Sleeman's, Frances Hartman, a wonderful, wonderful woman, um, was kind enough to share from the HR vice president of the HR department in Sleeman's um, the considerations, the checklist she went through on considerations for mergers and acquisitions. And uh, a very powerful little document. So it's up on the site, it's free take a copy and use it as see fit, stick it in your kit bag. But that's our task this this uh, this week. Look at the Sleeman's case. Again, context case. I'm not looking at the answers. This is for you to practice with your colleagues, practice some tools, give some thoughts about mergers and acquisitions as one of the uh, ways to move your generic strategies that Porter gives you, low cost, differentiated, and either broad or focused, or somewhere in the center, best cost model. There's five different models. You can only have one. But if you want to add the sweetener to that, if you want to add the frosting to the cake, then we look at some additional things that we'll talk about. And one of those is mergers and acquisitions to help drive you forward, particularly in a very fierce um, economy when the competition is stiff and you're fighting all those 2% margin points. Sometimes mergers and acquisitions is the way to go. Anyway, you're going to look at that this week. Have fun with it. What else? Um, assignment number one in my expectation is the time you see this, you'll have them back uh, marked. I'm very pleased with the grades. Um, it was good effort. Everybody really tried hard and did just what I had in mind. And uh, um, at the end of the day, I hope you learned something by the exercise and again, increased your awareness in the particular business or sector you're interested in uh, of all these marvelous things that are emerging through the fog. They're going to really disrupt your, your industry, your sector. And that was the purpose of it, to get a sense of it, and to start you into your session, your second as assignment, that you build on that and a few other innovative things, and then sit back for a few minutes and draw some conclusions about the dark side as to uh, what things do we have to watch for. We look at the bright, shiny things of, of uh, toasters that uh, are smart toasters, doors that work, uh, Amazon using its system to bring our uh, stuff into the front door. Uh, refrigerators tell us when it's time to order new food. Uh, all these marvelous things are happening. But what's the dark side of that? Things we have to watch for and be concerned. And is it worth the trade-off between all the bright shiny things and the exposure, the risk that we're faced to on the other side? I want to see some of that in your papers when you do it. Uh, this week I got an interesting post from uh, Wendy Steele. I just want to repeat it if I can. And she said the feds could erase Canada's debt by 2060. That's 40 years from now, over 40 years from now. Um, and most provinces face uh, very, very large fiscal uh, woes. Certainly Ontario is uh, really stressed out right now with, uh, with their problems. But this, I'm not impressed by that. Uh, it, it seems to me that we're, we're spending our children's children's credit card money so we can live well. That doesn't seem to be right to me. Um, so give some thought to that. And then she was also kind of supply a survey done for by the executives of the World Economic Forum Global Co Competitive Index came out. And the five big problems for doing business, one was the size of bureaucracy and inefficiency, uh, the ability for innovation uh, to take place in, in Canada. And uh, keep in mind Gary Hamill's bestseller there called The uh, Leading the Revolution, a fabulous book, I'll be a little old, but the, the principles are still there on how to make your ground fertile in your organization for uh, for businesses to take take hold. Um, limited access to financing for, for a small business. Um, an inadequate, inadequate educated workforce, and that's so important. We talked about Porter's uh, other model, the one that talks about the determinants on why nations are competitive, and some aren't competitive. And we said one of those determinants were factor endowments, both fixed and advanced. And these are advanced factor endowments. And they say in Canada, 
we need more of these advanced educated workforce if we're going to be competitive in a global marketplace. And finally, they said the tax rates and tax regulations are killing us. And so uh, an interesting finding that uh, brought to the attention, and, I, and uh, I thank Wendy very much. I thought it was worthwhile just repeating, but worth, worth looking at. Uh, the uh, market continues to soar. It's a bull market. Um, and uh, part of that, of course, is all of us have looked at this. I think we're on the verge today, as I, I think we're at uh, 23.5. We started at 17, another record uh, for us, driven by the uh, what's going on in the, in the States. And so people very much see the stock market going up 30%, like Amazon, in, in nine months, one year another deal. So they're cashing their, their, uh, their savings in one thing or another, rushing into equities and more equities. It, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy, more, more business, more, more demand coming into the demand supply curve rises the price of the market. So the market's going up and uh, it's wonderful news. It's some indication that there's a, a passion and love for what uh, President Trump is bringing in down below. We can get around the rough side of them, but uh, nevertheless, the, the, uh, some of the actual things that hit the road, they're, 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 it's meeting with, with favor by the small business folks down there, this tax reform and the, uh, uh, the new tax code coming in, the idea of writing it on uh, a postcard. It hasn't happened yet, but we're very close this week. I see there, I think tomorrow is Thursday, uh, that they're actually taking it to the House and see if we get it. Um, so we have this bull market running. And I guess the only caveat I'd put out there is that things just can't keep going like that. There's got to be a period of consolidation where things just stop for a little while and regroup. And that's fine. That That's healthy. It needs to be regrouped. Chance to work it all out for a little bit. What is not healthy, if we talk about that black swan, if something happens to Trump or something goes untoward here, uh, 23 back down to 17 knocks off 30% off your 401ks, your RSPs, your TSFAs, uh, drops down. And uh, the borrowings you're making, the banks will be calling on margins and things like that. So be cautious as we go forward. Um, I've noticed here too myself the idea that uh, America needs uh, the last two quarters, as we talked about the early part of this class, are hitting that 3% point we talked about. And if, if they can get up to 4%, that makes a difference in 1% increase in their GMP is equivalent to one and a half trillion dollars extra revenue for government, not counting any slashing and cutting they do. And so uh, all these expenditures he's planning on making down there um, could be offset if the GMP keeps moving up the way it's going right now towards 4%, which is, just hasn't happened in, uh, in 20, 30 years has America seen a 4% GMP. Um, Asia, of course, they see a lot of them. China normally runs at eight and a half and higher. Right now it's about 5.6, I think. Um, Kim Jong-un is talking about new satellites, uh, wants to put them up as a way to defuse this current situation. Uh, America's got, we talked last week, of three uh, um, aircraft groups straddling each side of the, uh, of the peninsula. Um, so he says, I just want to put some satellites up now for some satellite peaceful purposes. But we should be aware of that. They've got two satellites up there in the last couple of years, and most satellites travel from east to west. And so most defense postures in North America are on the coast and Canada's north, of course, for our neighbor Russia. We're ringed that way. But we don't have any ringing of, of, uh, of missiles and things to the south, to Mexico, to South America. It's kind of weak and thin on the ground. But their satellites are the only ones, to my knowledge, that go north to south. And they've got two of them going overhead every uh, 90 minutes, about 100 miles overhead, are North Korean satellites. And they're mystery. We don't know what's in them, if anything. But imagine for a moment if they were EMPs, if there were small little nuclear warheads that somehow could be set off above the Earth and do an EMP to the electrical system, electrical grid system in Canada. And he wants to put some more of these satellites up. So we should be on the guard. Um, we talked last week about China and the Silk Road and the in the Middle Kingdom, and uh, I think we went down the road and talked a little bit about the um, the Long March in 1949 and uh, the move by China simply wants to get rid of this. The colonies came in there, Britain and France and nations came in, uh, Boxer Rebellion time about 150 uh, years ago, and took Hong Kong, took Macau, took certain areas, and just said this is ours, and the Brits in Hong Kong, Macau was the, uh, the Dutch, uh, they had their, their pieces of the land. And the Chinese called that the period of humiliation. They were embarrassed because up to that point for 2,000 years, 
the, they were the middle kingdom. They were the center of the universe. The Europeans with Marco Polo wanted to know what was going on, gunpowder, etc., etc. They went to, the, to, to, to China to learn new secrets, new medicines, new, new ways of doing things. It was quite a trip, but they went. Um, the, but then they had this period of humiliation. And so then we saw with Mao Zedong at the end of 1949 coming back in and trying to reverse the trend. And uh, with the breakthrough in uh, 1978 um, and joining the World Trade Organization, they put a formal end to that period of humiliation. And again, we see the, the gravity coming back again at the center of the universe, the rise of the Middle Kingdom is starting to happen. The idea of the South China Sea, the East China Sea, the Silk Road, 70 nations tying into that Silk Road for economic purposes, growing economic interdependence on China and trade as we have with America, these nations have with China, and their sphere of influence is slowly expanding um, in that area. So they're restoring this, this Middle Kingdom. And I promised you last week, I brought in, I've got couple of these at home. I collect Chinese artifacts, but this is one of the clocks. You probably can't see it very well, but it's uh, very tinny. Still works, makes a ding, 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 ding sound, but it's almost like a Disneyland Mickey Mouse clock. The little hand of the uh, of the soldier down here with Mao's picture waves to keep climbing, tick tock, tick tock, and it's a very tinny sort of thing that you wouldn't expect, but again, keep in mind in 1966 Cultural Revolution, that was the quality of work that China could produce not the missiles and defenses that we talk about today. And I also brought in the three little red books for you to see. We have this one, which is a little larger version. It's all in Russian, little red book. We have this one, which is for the, uh, the general workforce, would have one of these. And then of course the upper class would have the, the gold leaf embossed one. But the story is the same in it. And anytime we debate, this was the, the Bible. You went here, if you could find support for your argument, you won in the Cultural Revolution in 1966. And so they're quite collectible, and I have a few of them. But I thought I'd bring them in today. Um, also part of what's this thing going on with the, the rise by the Americans into the Middle East, uh, initially with 9-11, um, Russia, to its credit, and a few others, understood, were sensitive, had some degree of empathy, and America said, do you mind if we come in and chase Ben Laden, whoever did this, around the Middle East? And uh, the Russians said, by all means, come on in. Crashed, the Americans came in, but they went everywhere. And all of a sudden, the Russians looked up and found the Americans in great numbers were just in spitting distance across one of the stands. They were lining up in this area. And so with the uh, the ease of the Cold War, the fall of the Iron Curtain in, in uh, 1989, and the uh, rise, uh, the fall of the Bamboo Curtain in, uh, in uh, 1978, those curtains come down. Now a new curtain has emerged, and it's been there for a while, but it's stiffening, and it's called the Shanghai Cooperative Association. And that runs all the way from Russia over to China through the northern stands where Russia where the Americans aren't, but right now it's stiffening, and they have trade agreements, and they have uh, military exercises. Uh, Iran is part of that, but only in observer status right now, but it is stiffening along that border. And so we're, we're watching very carefully on uh, what happens there, because it's important to us as strategists to understand the, uh, the way these nations, the geopolitics, the way the pieces on the chessboard, Brzezinski's idea, the grand chessboard, where the pieces are moving, we need to watch it. Um, Armanda got me going this week. Uh, she said, uh, we shake our fist at China's censorship of the media um, in another country, but we need to take a look at ourselves in the mirror. And then she goes on, and there was a wonderful post and some bar graphs and charts, some other thing or another, but she talks about the jobs being lost, and particularly in the post-media uh, coming on down, the, the uh, uh, negative media attention, the CBC with the $670 million you and I pay in our taxes each year, and you can work out $760 million over 34 million people, four people in a family to figure out what your portion is that. You give every year to the CBC so they can maintain their, uh, their presence. Um, but clearly they always seem to support the Liberal government. Um, in fact, it may be a question for us this week that to the CBC, initially it made a lot of sense because we had no way to connect, like the railway initially needed a railway to keep Canada together. We needed the CBC, some common radio system for Canada's north and, and the outback in northern Alberta and northern Quebec and uh, in, the, in the backwaters of, of Newfoundland that were only accessible by fish along the, the fishing boats along the coast. Um, we needed that thing to hold us together. But today with the advent of digital and satellites and those sort of things, 
Do we really need to pay $635 million of your tax money? Keep in mind you're borrowing that from your children's children. Um, do we need that CBC radio? Or can we do something a little better um, by uh, just taking some alternative media? Good question for today. And anyway, here, a report goes on about fake news media and one thing or another. And then a table caught my eye um, with respect to... Uh, uh, they did a, uh, uh, a survey of folks and asked the question about organizations and are they biased. And they said, yes, the Global Mail, 50% of the people surveyed said the Global Mail is biased. And I brought the Global Mail in today, and I, you probably notice I don't seem to refer to it too much. And I love the Global Mail. Uh, it's got good materials. I enjoy it, particularly on the weekend. I love and ingest every word of it. But I haven't had it now for about three months. And the reason for that was is that uh, I got tired of reading nine articles every day, anti-Trump, and not one good thing in it, uh, in favor of Trump. And there are some good things Trump has done. Disregard his idiosyncratic factors, which, which can make you pull your hair out. But in any event, they just would carry nine slams at Trump, and uh, that's just too biased for me. Um, I need a fair and balanced approach. So I called the editor, told him to cancel the subscription. They're very friendly, very supportive, and say when I'm ready, come back, and they'll give me a free subscription, et cetera, et cetera. I have to confess, I'm starting to test again, going back in. Not one article in here today is anti-Trump, which is interesting. Uh, but uh, it certainly validates what I thought, and I see this survey done. Global Mail, 50% of the people believe that it is bias um, and in favor of the Liberal Party, uh, based on the reports. Um, and the question is, if you start bias, if you start shaping the news that nine articles have got you going anti-Trump, anti-right wing, anti-this philosophy, are we destroying what democracy is? Democracy is free speech. Democracy is the, uh, is the right to a free press. If we don't have a free, unbiased press to give us the facts and let us decide what, the, uh, what course of action should be taken, we're lost. And so it, it bothers me with this idea of this consolidation of the ownership of the media in Canada and in the States, uh, that uh, a very small handful of people run our media. You probably don't even know their faces, like they used to be Dizzy Asper uh, in Alberta, ran a big chunk of the information system in Canada. But they have the power to uh, put some moral suasion on editors, et cetera, et cetera, to, uh, at particular election time, to carry the theme they want carried. And that, to me, is against democracy. Anyway, we can talk, so let's talk a bit about the importance of free speech and can we have democracy if the Global Mail can't be trusted. Anyway, have a look at that. Business Intelligence this week uh, carried a report about self-driving cars and how they'll impact the bottom line of consumer pockets. Uh, it says that semi-autonomous vehicles are poised to transform the economics of transportation and logistics. This transformation will come at enormous cost savings as well as massive new revenue opportunities that will benefit the automakers, mobility service providers, truck operators, logistic companies, and their enterprise clients, and in the end consumer. And then charts and graphs were provided, talking in terms of like electric cars will drive down the cost sharing cost car sharing cost to 46 cents a mile, from 46 cents a mile down to 31 cents a mile, according to Detroit, uh, De 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 Deloitte. Uh, autonomous electric semi-trucks will cut the cost by 60, 70 percent, because these are drone trucks. Um, the last mile delivery um, hovers around uh, $1.50. It's going to drop in terms of to 90 cents, from $1.50 to 90 cents for that last mile delivery is coming our way all because of the introduction of autonomous electric vehicles. And we're getting to know that now, aren't we, in the course. We see these things coming and, and the ripple effects of all this, both on fossil fuels, on labor costs, and just better service to the uh, better quality of life for, for, for us folks. I noticed in the paper today that we talked a week or two ago about Walmart and Amazon, and Walmart laid off the mark, but it has decided, and that's one of the strategies we'll talk about in this course, is offense and defensive actions you can take um, when you design your strategy and how you're going to treat your competitors. And one of them is go toe-to-toe. -to -toe. And that appears what Walmart's doing. They've, they've dramatically increased their product lines in the last month or two. Uh, they've now put out a policy of $35 expenditure gets your free delivery, next day delivery to your, uh, to your home or whatever it is you purchased. And Amazon just uh, bounced out uh, yesterday, the day before, saying they responded with, well, if it's 35 there, it's $25 here. So Amazon delivery costs drop to $25. The free marketplace works, folks. When we have competition, the price drops. When you have monopolies, that price would not drop from the $35 down to 25 
And if that is true, do we need competition in Google and Facebook and Twitter, these sort of accounts? Do we need more competition in Shaw uh, Cable? Do we need more of that coming into our places? We can talk a bit about that. Um, NOCA, uh, used to be a camera organization, is now moving quickly, bullishly, into the digital health efforts. Um, they see the giant market uh, forecast to reach $379 billion in global health care market uh, for products they want to produce. So they're repositioning out of the traditional market over. And we saw um, Hewitt Packard do the same thing from, uh, from printers moving over more into the consulting and uh, this data storage areas. Um, we talk in terms of the oil companies in Alberta, maybe you should be doing some repositioning from fossil fuel to some other energy energy thoughts. But they go through a bit of that. That was interesting uh, from the business intelligence. Um, military briefing, um, I got that one in this week. Uh, we have this uh, Spanish central government is called a snap election uh, uh, in the Barcelona area there for direct control, uh, December 21st hoping they can bring it back under control. It, it's spinning around right now. Uh, Benghazi attack, uh, they found a suspect who was involved with that at a reasonable level. I have him um, about to go at a CIA base to uh, be interrogated and figure out a little bit more about it with the FBI folks. And uh, that may be bad news for Mrs. Clinton. Uh, may you recall she said, what difference does it make when uh, four sold soldiers or four folks lie dead? And uh, not much of an investigation of how that all came about. And it certainly does make a difference to the to the soldiers' parents and wives and families and children. So, um, in Iraq, Canada is, uh, suspends our special forces over there on its training and assistance. Uh, and we did a lot of folks there on both sides, but primarily with the Kurds. Um, we did a lot of time bonding with the Kurds, helping the Kurds, training the Kurds. And the Kurds were very successful. They fought and fought well up there. And then last week we talk about now the war is over. Uh, exactly how far down the Kurds want their own autonomous area uh, and they want a piece of Syria and a piece of Turkey as well and now all of a sudden the war is over um, they're gonna have to fight hard to maintain what they want to want what they want to get out of this and uh, the problem for Canada is is that we were on both sides of that coin and now if the battle is over and ISIS has been beaten off the field which I believe in large part has taken place and they've moved now to Africa and other places to reestablish their bases. Um, Canada is now sitting in a very precarious position that as much as we believe in the Kurds and the Kurds should be supported, et cetera, et cetera, um, at least I do, um, the challenge for us becomes what if Iran controls the, uh, the Shia militia over there who also fought against ISIS? But once ISIS is gone, the Shia militia at this point, with Iran as the uh, puppet master, is going to swing around and try to control as much as they can of these northern oil fields and of Iraq. Um, and they're going to be doing that along with Baghdad wanting to control part of that. So it's going to get messy again. And uh, with ISIS removed, the next threat against again will be, I suspect, um, Shia versus Sunni um, with Iran, uh, the largest regional force now in that area, uh, playing a large role. And after all the expenditure and capital wealth and pleas the Americans put into that, uh, they're going to have very little to show for it. Um, worth showing. The, uh, in fact, I, I, when we talk about special forces, it, I'm very proud of the, when we first went to Afghanistan, just to digress for a moment. Uh, Canada's got a number of infantry regiments. Uh, one is called the Princess Patricia Light Infantry, and they're in, uh, in uh, Alberta um, and London, Ontario. And they were here in Victoria, uh, Victoria, I think, for no, they weren't the Queen's Home. Sure. In any event, um, in uh, Capion Hill in the Korean War, um, the Canadians, the PPCLI, the company, held their hill, while other hills were held by other United Nations forces, and uh, with success. And the way they did it is they got down in the trenches and called the artillery shell down on top as the Chinese hordes were coming up over the hill. But for holding the hill and saving the American hill over here, who were about to be overrun, when it was dust all settled, they received the presidential citation. It's the only uh, Canadian organization, battalion group ever to receive such a decoration. And only a few countries, have only a few organizations in the States have it. And it's a little blue patch with a gold, uh, 
bar around they were on their shoulder. But how proud I would be when the first troops off the plane in Afghanistan, when we started this thing, were the PPCLI stepping off, being met by American troops, who look with some degree of awe and amazement that here were Canadians were in their American presidential citation. And so I just digress with that of how proud we took on uh, Remembrance Day week coming up that we should uh, know a little bit of our own Canadian history. Um, so what else? See the oil rich up there, we talked about that. Uh, Kenyatta, um, with respect, corrupt uh, sense from all reports in uh, Kenya. Um, won another election, 92 small percent. Uh, lots of disruption down there. That hasn't resolved itself yet. Um, China and South Korea, Korea have agreed to amend uh, uh, the relationships a little bit over the missiles being installed in in uh, South Korea in response to North Korea, but China's not happy about it, supplied by the Americans. And uh, it doesn't say exactly what they've done to soften the harshness between them, but uh, it has taken place. But China enacted several punitive measures uh, on South Korea to include denying visas for South Koreans and placing the unusual regulatory burdens on South Korea's conglomerates, uh, et cetera, provided the land to it. It's unclear uh, what the thawing means, but it was interesting that during that brief period, uh, $6.5 billion was uh, lost in Chinese tourism uh, by South Korea. That represented uh, just about a half of 1% of their GMP for the year. So it had a significant impact. And that's the danger we talk about with the Middle King Kingdom getting this economic interdependence with the nations surrounding these 70 other nations. Uh, they're quietly eating away at Americans' uh, global power. The Russian Navy uh, says it triples its deployment in the first five years uh, out there. but. Uh, reading through it, all the marvelous things they've been doing and the trips uh, in around the Syria area and deployments they've had, et cetera, et cetera. But it also goes on to talk in terms that, uh, um, and I think I mentioned last week that the aircraft carrier, they couldn't afford to move on with the uh, repairs and maintenance on it and uh, had to drastically reduce all the monies available for a new series of projects. Um, and they reduced the number of overall ship to surface numbers they had and defense spending. So they're, they're cutting back, much like Reagan was able to do with the Star Wars with the Russians. It may be that they're running out of money with the price of oil. But having said that, Syria is important to, uh, to Russia because they've invested in and have part ownership of a port on the Mediterranean that is uh, where the Russian uses to put its uh, Mediterranean fleet. And it doesn't have too many uh, opportunities down there to get access to the water. Um, Japan and India begin uh, joint anti-submarine warfare exercises, uh, all part of what's going on with the Kim Jong-un and that area. Um, well, this was interesting. North Korea was hacked. The Dawu shipbuilding uh, uh, warship blueprints, which had all the new uh, missiles that the Americans have. Apparently, uh, there was some access to the uh, computers, and the hacking took place, and the blueprints have been accessed, and the, the privileged information has been taken away, um, and they suspect, obviously, by, by the Chinese. Um, keep in mind, there's six domains of war, and sometimes we lose sight of this. The conventional ones, we're used to the land, sea, and air, but the, the space and the cyber and the economic warfare are going around us all day long. And In fact, the American situation right now that we look at down there with the... Uh, with the Trump and uh, Russian and uh, Hillary and all this stuff going on, um, they knew about this. They just didn't harden up their defenses for cyber warfare. And so it was a quite an easy entry system to go in and access this sort of stuff. So uh, anyway, that's some of the data that we picked up there. Let's look at the paper for a few minutes, if we can. Um, we've got a grocery fixing probe going on over the price of uh, baked goods and packaged bread products. Uh, it seems like George Weston and Loblaws said in a joint statement they're cooperating fully, but there's something going on by the Anti-Competition Bureau uh, looking at they got together to fix the prices of bread for Canadians and other things. So it's, uh, it's worth looking at. In fact, if you stop there, I mean, it seems to me that gas stations, banks, within a half of a tenth of a point, almost instantly all gas stations raise or lower their prices. That's got to be price fixing. And so... Uh, I could be wrong, but they've got a long way to go and have a look at that. Uh, computer problems with the ICBC, our provincial insurance plan, that were down the other day. Uh, but it just shows how dependent we are on cyber warfare, and, uh, and we talked a lot about that. The flu shot season starts up with, with learns the H3N2 strain. Um, they're talking in terms of a quarter of a million 
260,000 doses have been ordered for the season. And so the question for us today is, uh, with the advent of mercury and much has been written about the, the dangers of flu shots, what do we have an informed decision to say is a flu shot a good or a bad thing? Um, or are you concerned about the uh, some of the, uh, albeit uh, minority, that uh, sometimes has uh, bad outcomes from flu shots? Let's talk. I haven't taken one in about 10 years. Um, Victoria homeowners face a tax hike. Um, topping 90%. And again, I, I'm concerned about the spending by government. Um, in one hand, we have the, the cost of living, we have the inflationary costs that are here. Um, they should certainly be met for, for seniors, et cetera, et cetera. But when government goes in double-digit growth and taxes go in double-digit growth, um, the cost of ferries go, the cost of insurance goes, the cost of hydro goes, cost of water goes, um, it's out of alignment for folks on fixed incomes. Um, how do your grandparents survive uh, when uh, our political leaders keep on spending? We should spend within our budget. We shouldn't be spending our children children's money uh, on their credit cards if we do this. In any event, uh, this must be tax season out where you live. Uh, let's talk a bit about uh, taxes and uh, are they out of control? Have we tax fatigue in this country? Ottawa issues a plea for private icebreakers. Uh, our icebreakers are so old. The, the, I was on the, the Saint Laurent many, many years ago. Uh, these things were built, uh, I think, 40 so on plus years ago. Maybe the Saint Laurent was probably even built older than that in the 50s, I suppose. Um, we've got real old, old ships. And they can do the spring ice, they can do the young ice, but old ice, old gnarly ice, we can't get through the north. We don't have any ships to do that. We're building some lightweight, um, icebreakers, but again, for the old ice, we can't get through it with these new breakers. But yet Canada's north, this new superhighway up north of us that the Chinese and others are whipping through, uh, we can't seem to access. And so Ottawa here has said uh, help to the private sector. Um, we need the short-term need. Anybody out there want to supply us some icebreakers? And uh, we promised a new polar icebreaker called the John G. Diefenbaker. I worked for John Diefenbaker back in 1956 as a ward chairman, and I got a picture and a signature and things from him, he and his wife. Because his wife was May, I could be wrong. I met them. In any event, um, they've named this uh, icebreaker after John G. Um, he was from Alberta, too. Alberta. Not Red Deer, I don't think, but from Alberta. In any event, um, old Diefenbaker, we're going to name it after him. It was supposed to be finished, but they've, the delays are such, the delivery of this is going to be sometime in the next decade before we get an icebreaker. And so they look for some private icebreakers who want to do it. And that's consistent. Recall a couple couple weeks ago, we talked about the Navy and their the provider, the, ship, the ships of provision, take the oil and the rations out and follow behind the, behind the, uh, the fleet, um, mail and that sort of stuff, running it up. Um, they're not ready yet, and they're running behind, and they're expensive. And so uh, Montreal uh, um, Shipbuilding Yard, Davies, has come out and said, we'll take a couple of container ships and uh, quickly rig them out, and for a few hundred, a few hundred million dollars, compared to the other ones that are billions of dollars, uh, use these. And they're coming out through the system and look quite workable. And that begs the question, why are we blowing all this money on the new ones when these will work? Um, fake gold bar, counterfeit, counterfeiting attempt. Um, I think all of us tend to buy, or in due course you'll buy these little gold bars with a stamp from the Canadian Mint on saying 90.9999 on it, with a seal on it, and you stick them away in your sock. But somebody did that and then finally took them back and found out that they weren't what they reported to be. He's just been keeping a, a lump of lead, I suppose, in his, in his stock, or her stock. And so uh, we have to be careful out there. This can, there's uh, counterfeiting going on with the Royal Mint uh, seal on this, these gold bars that we stick away in our, in our safety deposit box and never think much about. Um, but it, it reminds me of a story that, uh, this is a couple of years ago now, that uh, during the Cold War, um, the gold from uh, Germany for safety because of the Russians, the threat of coming through the passes, uh, they put their gold in America, in France, and in Britain. And uh, Merkel, about 18 months ago, um, said, if you don't mind, uh, I'd like to get my gold back now. Well, Britain, of course, stepped right up, said, no problem, here it is, and shipped it over to them. Um, a recent, initially, France and America both said, sorry, we can't do until 
2018, I think it was, and this was two years ago, can we send you your gold, which caused some heartburn among the Germans. They didn't fight it out in the papers, but there shouldn't be a problem getting your money back. You gave them in trust. The French have recently given some of the gold back, and I understand that America hasn't done very much on giving the gold back yet to Germany. But we can look for that little story, too, as well as the gold story and the importance of it in our last resort economy if something was to go sour. WestJet's got a low-cost brand, a Swoop, that uh, features higher extra fees. And uh, we talked the other day, didn't we? I think we talked about the... Uh, if you have a good brand like DeWalt, a real powerful brand on making uh, screwdrivers and electrical things that construction company uses, the yellow ones that the construction workers use out there. Um, and uh, against that, you have the Black & Decker, which they acquired. But you wouldn't find a con contractor out there working on the site with a Black & Decker. You and I might have one around the home. But to make it different, they put different names on them, different colors. So you have DeWalt, you have Black & Decker. And they don't show the, the cross between the two as all owned by the same company, manufactured in the same plants by the same people. Um, and so here's WestJet, low-cost brand called Swoop, doing the same thing. Um, but there's no secret. Swoop belongs to them. Uh, but they're going to charge extra fees uh, for your, uh, um, oh, but I see the different things you're doing. Well, for registering your bags, things of that nature, they're going to charge you a little extra to change your change your seat to uh, do a reservation change, etc. They're going to charge you an extra percentage to make it happen. So they're going to try to make some extra money there, and but yet give you the low on the front end of the side. They think it may drop the cost of their uh, ticket prices by 30 to 40% lower at the end of the day, but that's because the uh, airport charges are going to be reduced. And right now, Canada's airport charges are among the highest in the world. Vancouver International Airport is a beautiful airport, but again, you pay for it, the price of your ticket. And if you go down to some American airports, they're nowhere near grandiose, but the price of the ticket is cheap and gets you from point A to point B. The same with our BC ferries. If you take from BC, the uh, in Victoria, the Coho, little small little owned by the Ball Company, across the pond to Port Angeles, it's very budget price. The uh, the fellow uh, that you sells you the ticket to get on also helps you load your car and uh, serves your hot dog uh, on the ferry. Does all jobs. Very small staff. Runs it lean and mean. But the price of a ticket is way down here, and. Uh, if I use the BC ferries who live in the finest office buildings in town with gold-plated pensions and insurance and high salaries, um, it's an excursion. You have to go sit in the tarmac for an hour and a half and visit all the facilities they have there for you to buy and sell things. And uh, the trip across is all very nice and uh, good quality and get off the other end. But you pay a premium for that. And I think most of us just be happy to keep it low cost and not differentiated as the uh, generic strategy for, for ferries. Um, industry warns the feds could cut drug prices could be harmful. Well, here we have the Canadian drug manufacturers that I believe to be fat and uh, what they do and how they do it. They need money for R&D and they're protected under patents for a period of that. But uh, right now we have it being looked at by the uh, uh, review board, the Patterson Medicine Prices Review Board in Canada, a government organization, to see how those prices compare and can they be justified, much like we're supposed to be doing with uh, uh, the price of cable television and uh, the BC Hydro rates is what you pay for electricity. They're doing this as well for this. Um, and so they have lobbyists. The industry has lobbyists arguing that it shouldn't be, it's going to be harmful, it's going to be bad for Canada, uh, reduce R&D, et cetera, et cetera. So maybe we should look at that a little bit, and uh, what is the role of lobbyists? Are lobbyists a good or a bad thing? That's an interesting question. Um, to what extent does do government directing minds need to be educated with the facts? And to what extent do you cross the line that it's more than just education of the, of the directing minds? It actually becomes uh, by buying things and taking them to lunch and buying $1,000 plate dinners for the premier, are we doing past lobbying to actually influence peddling? And so it's a fine line. We could look at that and the need to register as lobbyists. Um, and it, not so much these days, but we used to have pharmaceutical representatives. Their job was to go to the uh, to the doctors and, again, lobby to educate very quickly the new drug and give them some samples and explain this to help them in their practice. It was ongoing education. It was very much needed. But it comes to light that there are trips paid for and conventions and things, all expense paid, high-end living, 
uh, paid for by the drug companies to these doctors that would uh, support their uh, their uh, their drugs. And that comes to the, uh, I guess, the Bentley ethical test uh, to commend to you. We're going to cover that in this class. Uh, very short little six questions. How does it feel? How does it smell? Tell your kids about it. It was on the front page of tomorrow's paper. How would you feel? I commend that to you. When you get to that stage, have a look at it, even print out a copy. And those days when you have to close the door and make hard decisions, if you can answer all right to those questions, you don't have an ethical problem. Um, Gaza Tunnel uh, detonated by Israel. Um, it's tough over there when you take the, the folks in the West Bank and the, uh, and the folks down in the Gaza Strip, or the Palestinians that live there and fight there, it's uh, once upon a time um, they live there but they've been pushed, pushed back, uh, part of the Balfour Agreement, and uh, uh, in the late 40s it all took place, and uh, Israel got a toehold in there, and they needed some place to go after the war. But the Palestinians, uh, you may have some empathy for the, uh, the average working folk. And the way this place is divided right now, you have the Gaza Strip down here on the Mediterranean, and the other part of their country is up over here on the West Bank. And between there and there is a railway that Israel controls. So they can't bring in rations and supplies to get up here to this piece. So they're very much at the mercy of the Israelis up here in the West Bank. And so it's, uh, until that is fixed, it's going to be a constant, a constant problem. Um, when I served in the Middle East, it was, uh, it was an issue. Anyway, if we can look at that on the West Bank and Hezbollah and those sort of things. New Zealand is moving to ban foreigners from buying their homes. Um, much like we talked about in Vancouver, and there was a great post this week, and I'm sorry with the age of certain frailty of mind steps in, but one of the, uh, one of our colleagues posted a couple of good charts about, uh, oh no, that was countries that had already banned the, uh, the headscarves. Sorry, I missed that. Uh, this is about, uh, this is for home buying, and so New Zealand has passed laws that uh, no foreigners need apply to buy homes in, uh, in New Zealand, and so we could talk about that, and then does that in fact have a, uh, some sort of overhang for us into uh, Victoria and Vancouver and Toronto, et cetera. And we put, we put uh, the 15% charge, but the latest stats that I saw for this year, sales are still up to Chinese by 5% higher than last year on four homes. It just took it in stride and it's, it, hasn't, it hasn't solved it. It's just made the homes more expensive. Um, good. Um, Tories, yeah, we talked about Bill Morneau, the... Uh, uh, blind trust, uh, $21 million, didn't register it, et cetera, et cetera. And again, I refer you to the Bentley ethical test on the roles of ministers and when light flashes on how they feel. Um, well, I think the time is such, I'll probably call it there. I had some articles both in the Globe this week and another article from the Foreign Affairs, but I, I think that's enough to get us started. And you add any stories you want. Let's just have a good discussion. But I have to say, again, I continue to enjoy the class. This is the halfway mark. Have some fun. Be able to you anytime. Give me a call. Enjoy the weekend. Bye now.